uh, uh, New York Ur Urologic section, as well as everyone that woke up early uh, to hear the talk this morning. Please reach out directly by email if there's any additional questions. Okay, thank you so much again for that phenomenal lecture. Um, Dr. Stone, are you with us? I am, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Good morning, this is Gina. Good morning, um, Gina. Good morning, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, I'm just gonna introduce you. Dr. Stone is a professor of urology and radiation oncology at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, he did his training in urologic oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and he's the former chief of urology at Elmhurst Hospital. He's gonna be speaking to us this morning uh, about brachytherapy for a prostate cancer. Um, so take it away, Dr. Stone. Thank you, Gina. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. I am actually in Vail, Colorado, so it's a little early for me. Uh, I would like to give you a little bit more insights in my background. I had been at Mount Sinai since 1986 after finishing my fellowship in neurologic oncology at Sloan Kettering where I learned the uh, open retropubic technique of doing radioactive acetum plant. I took that to Mount Sinai and in 1990 started our own technique we call the real-time implant using ultrasound guidance. So it's been a, a long 30 years plus at Mount Sinai with this technique. Uh, I retired from clinical practice in 2012 where I, when I moved to Vail, Colorado. So I don't see patients anymore, but I still stay very active uh, with the program at Mount Sinai with the teaching, I teach worldwide, and the residents at Mount Sinai and the medical students are very involved with the program. So I teach them remotely, sometimes at Mount Sinai when I come to New York, and they participate in many publications because we have a very robust database, and I welcome anybody who's on the call to uh, give me contact me and we could, I'd be happy to get you involved with doing some research. We have not had so much COVID out here, but uh, I had a cold in March. I think I picked it up in New York when I came in early March and it wasn't so bad, but it, I am now COVID antibody positive. So it's been really tough for New York City, but it's, it's for me, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't very tough and I did have the, the disease and I, my hat goes off to all you who have been working so hard to try and keep our patients safe and our colleagues and friends too. So without much further, we'll get on to brachytherapy update. There's a lot of information here and I'm not gonna try and overwhelm you with data, but there are a lot of practical points that uh, I've learned over the 30 years and I wanna share those with you. Uh, and I think they'll be very helpful. Whether you practice brachytherapy or not, you will eventually see patients who have been treated with a sedum plant and knowing how to best manage them and keep them out of trouble will be very important for you in your careers. So the, the first transperineal ultrasound guided source placement, source placement started with Heinrich Holm in Copenhagen in the late 1980s. He used uh, the monoplanar BNK 850 probe 1850 probe, which only could view an axial imaging. Uh, Hakam Ragta, John Blasco, and Peter, Brim, Peter Grimm came from Seattle and they learned that technique in Copenhagen from him. And they brought that back to Seattle and that became known as the Seattle technique. Important point of the, uh, this uh, technique is they didn't do any post-implant dosimetry. Uh, so they really couldn't check the quality of their implants, which was uh, an important factor because uh, for 10 years after they started, they really didn't have a handle on how well they were doing and what the pitfalls of the implant program was. It just shows you how they did it. Uh, they used a probe, monoplanar probe. This was the first attempt to actually use ultrasound to place the radioactive seeds, but they only could see the prostate, like I said, in axial imaging. We started the program at Mount Sinai in 1990. Like I said, I came in 1986 and working with the radiation oncologists at uh, Sinai and the physicists, we developed our own program. Now, coming from the surgical perspective, you had just had a great lecture on prostatectomy. 
I approached uh, the problem of trying to figure out how to best put radioactive seeds in the prostate from a, as a surgical procedure, not as a radiation procedure. So I needed to make sure everything was in place when I started the program so it would mimic surgery, which meant figuring out how to best space the seeds and place them in the prostate, making sure they were placed properly. So the only way you could make sure they were placed properly was to be able to do a CT scan and look at the prostate so you could see the soft tissues and the bony structures along with the seeds. So we wrote our own CT-based dosimetry program in-house back in 1990. And from that, we learned that spacing of the seeds and the amount of seeds you needed to put it in a prostate to achieve the dose required a lot of revisions from what was currently known back in 1990. And those revisions took four years. So research moves very slowly and you have to continually check the work you do to make sure that you're achieving what you anticipate. So we had to increase the amount of activity and the number of seeds uh, by more than 40% over those four years. And we had to change from wh where we put them within the prostate, was, which was mostly uniform, to moving them into a more peripheral location. In 1996, we got our hands on the first biplanar electric, elect, electronic probe, which was originally developed by BNK for Jeff Cohen, who was doing cryotherapy at Allegheny Hospital at that time. And we adapted the probe uh, to uh, use for a brachytherapy. And then in 1999, I started working with a precursor to Variseed, and we wrote an intraoperative real-time program, which we introduced in uh, 2000 worldwide. So we, like I said, we started in 1990 and I worked with radiation oncologist Mike Wesson and physicist Keith DeWeingert. And keeping in mind that I wanted it to be surgical, I started, to, I started initially in 1990 to surgically stage the patients, which we did with seminal vesicle biopsy and laparoscopic pelvic lymph node dissection, which I added to the technique in 1991. We would do it just like we did surgery in those days. We'd do, I would do a pelvic lap node dissection. We'd send off frozen sections. If they were negative, we'd go ahead and start the uh, brachytherapy procedure. And the, we perform the post-op dosimetry 30 days afterwards. And also importantly, I started the program because I was originally involved in research doing BPH. I created a, a, robust, <clears throat> a robust database. So our database is now 30 years old. We have the largest, uh, longest follow-up database in the world involving radioactive steed implant, which we currently maintain. So this is what uh, the seminal vesicle biopsy looked like. You image the prostate in sagittal. There's the biopsy guide. And there's, you can see the, on the blow up, the biopsy needle uh, entering the prostate, the posterior wall of the seminal vesicles. You can see this is early on, this is back in 1991. And here's a normal seminal, seminal vesicle. And here's a seminal vesicle that's invaded with prostate cancer on the right. So what did, what did that teach us? So we did a study, Debbie Linza was uh, one of our radiation residents, uh, comparing the seminal vesicle biopsy in the brachytherapy patients to a cohort who had prostatectomy, looking at PSA levels and Gleason scores. And you note that as the PSA went up above 20, the positivity rate for the seminal vessel biopsy was 32%, same as prostatectomy, 32%. And for men with the Gleason 7 above, the positivity rate was 37% compared to 20% for prostatectomy patients. So you could adequately identify men with T3B disease uh, before they had uh, procedure, but once you identified them, you had to say, what am I going to do with this patient? So we developed a technique to put the radioactive seeds within the seminal vesicle. So this sagittal image, there's a seminal vesicle there with the arrow pointing to the anterior wall of the seminal vesicles, and the white represents a seed that's been ejected from the needle. There's a needle to the right there, and you can see the seed is in the anterior wall of the seminal vesicle. This is a bladder up here. The idea was not to just free float them in the, in the side of the seminal vesicles, but to put them in the wall so they would stay put. And when you did that, if you look over here on the right, this is an interoperative uh, 
reconstruction of the prostate, the purple line represents the target dose, in this case, 110 gray of palladium. And the sum of vesicles here in orange, you can see how the target dose actually covers the entire prostate and the seminal vesicles in a contiguous fashion. The, the yellow represents 150% of the target dose, 150 gray in this case. And you actually could boost the dose to the seminal vesicles much higher than the target dose. And down here on the bottom is blue is the rectum and you could space the C's it's such that you're not actually irradiating the, rect the rectal, anterior rectal wall. And when you looked at the data of the patient a paper we published many years ago um, and there were 52 men with a positive seminal vesicle biopsy out of 526 who had intermediate to high risk disease. We looked at the likelihood of PSA failure using a definition we use for prostatectomy and we were running about 64% at 10 years free of biochemical failure. And when we compared that at the time to nine prostatectomy series using the same definition, lo and behold, 64% are free from failure. So what we learned from this study is if you encounter a man with a T3B disease, he doesn't necessarily have already have metastatic disease. These are all surgically staged patients. And you can salvage or treat successfully the majority of the patients, but you need an upfront technique to make sure that you're treating the disease that's spread outside the prostate. These patients also had supplemental external beam. And we'll talk more about the benefits of doing that and what radiation doses mean in patients with high-risk prostate cancer. There are many uh, different types of sources. We typically use most commonly the iodine-125 source. It's got a relatively low energy when you compare it to external beam or HDR, but the energy is very high. The radiation dose is very high when you're very close to the seed, but it dissipates very quickly. So when you're about one centimeter away from the radioactive seed, there is very little radiation. The half-life of iodine is two months, and it takes five half lights to deliver the radiation. So if you put an iodine scene in a man's prostate, it's really almost 300 days before the dose, dose goes down to what, we'll, what we consider background radiation. So it's a long time for the patient to be receiving radiation. And that's one of the reasons why men will have symptoms if you use your uh, iodine that can last one to two years because the radiation is being delivered over a over a long period of time. This is a, <clears throat> what the cut up of the cutout of the iodine seed looks like. It's about four and a half millimeters long. It's 0.8 millimeters in width. It's hollow. Inside is usually a marker. In this particular seed design, it's a silver rod. And the reason why there's a marker inside is so it appears on uh, CT scan and x-ray, you can see it. And on the silver marker, the I radioactive isotope, in this case iodine, is absorbed on the marker. And the, these are all made by machine or by hand. And when they load the radioactive rod inside, they weld the end caps on to seal the source inside. Now, when we started the program, the, the world was using what's called a uniform source distribution, also called a Quimby source di distribution. And what that told us was you should put the seeds in, if a square represents the prostate, you put the seeds in uniformly. So every centimeter of seed goes almost like a checkerboard. However, when you do that, something happens that wasn't really anticipated, which is that because all the seeds inside accumulate the radiation, it's much hotter inside. So let's say, for example, our target is 30, 30 gray. By doing this, the inside, the inside rectangle is receiving 45 gray. That's 150% of the 30. Well, that may make sense if this was just a solid tumor, but we have our urethra in the middle. And giving the urethra so much radiation is not a good idea. And that was one of the pitfalls in the Seattle program because they were following this for 10 years before they realized they overdid it on the urethra and a lot of patients suffered because of that. However, because we had the post-implant dosimetry on day one or patient one of our, pa of our patients, we could tell by, by doing this 
uniform source distribution. Now we're overdoing it in the center of the gland. And as you recall earlier, I said we progressively move the seeds to the periphery. So we, knew, we, use, we learned very quickly within the first two years, we needed to sort, put the sources in a peripheral distribution. So the bulk of the seeds are in the periphery of the prostate. And though we can still achieve our target of 30, and now the center of the gland is not lower than the target, but it's only slightly higher. Thus, we could spare the urethra of the high doses, not of the treatment doses, but of very high doses, and at the same time, hit the periphery with the dose that we needed to hit the periphery with. This is a CT scan going back uh, to the early 1990s. You can see the urethra in there. The patient has a catheter. This is the post-implant dosimetry. The white dots represent the seeds, and you can see how they're all spaced around the periphery, and there's really no seeds in the center of the gland. This is one of the very early uh, dosimetry studies 30 days afterwards. Again, the white dots represent the seeds, the orange is the prostate, and you can see there are no seeds in the center. The yellow line around the prostate is our target dose, just like I showed you in the schematic. The dark blue line represents 150%. So even though we do a peripheral spacing, you still will get much higher doses within the prostate, but the key is to keep these higher doses away from the urethra and to distribute them to the outer, outer part portion of the gland. And fortunately, we were able to achieve that with our technique. The next thing uh, we um, publish, and, and this became a very important component of our program, is not to rely on the physical doses. So when I mean physical dose, uh, you have a patient who's getting external beam and you prescribe him 81 gray, or he's getting a seed implant with iodine and you prescribe them 100, 160 gray. So they're, they're different physical doses, but they're supposed to have the same biological effect. But what happens when you take a patient and you give him a combination of a seed implant and external beam radiation, which we typically do with the very high risk patients because we want to boost the dose. How do you make sense of what that dose equals? Because they're two totally different physical sources. So we came up with this concept of the biologically effective dose. Now, it wasn't our concept, but it was our concept to apply to prostates who received brachytherapy and brachytherapy plus external beam. So that allowed us to create a common denominator, we call it the BED, whereby you could calculate the BED from the physical doses from the two different sources, one being the implant, one being the external beam, and come up one dose to compare your results for the patients. And in this seminal paper that my colleague Richard Stock published in 2006, you can see the different BED cut points going from 100 gray up to 200 gray, and 200 gray if you were to back calculate external beam is equal to about 105 gray of external beam, far higher than the 81 gray we typically prescribe when we're using just IMRT or IGRT. And you can see that those cut points as you get up around 160 to 200 gray, it sort of collects itself here in a much higher likelihood of being free from PSA failure. When you look at the regression analysis, uh, Kaplan-Meier regression on the Cox, you can see what factors are important for uh, affecting PSA failure, and you can see that the dose factors in quite significantly here. X, XB is the same as the hazard rate. So the hazard rate for these dose cut points is about 0.25 every time you go up 20 gray. Now, uh, after many years, we started publishing our long-term outcomes, and we started learning a lot of things about what happens when you combine certain elements with brachytherapy and what happens uh, to the patients uh, in long-term follow-up. So we found that 15 years, we had very good overall survivor survival for all three risk groups at 94% cost-specific survival. Of course, men with the very low NCCN status have very few prostate cancer deaths. But we also learned something else very importantly. We typically prescribe nine to, 12, nine to 24 months, mostly nine months of hormonal therapy in our high-risk patients. 
And when we looked at the survival outcomes and we tracked all cause survival, it turned out that men who had six or a month less of hormonal therapy combined with the radiation, they had a superior survival, it's all cause survival at 15 years of roughly 58%, versus those men who had more than six months of hormonal therapy, where the all cause survival was about 7% less at 51%. Now, this was not unknown in the radiation literature that hormonal therapy uh, could have a negative effect on all cause survival, but it was the first time it was published in a brachytherapy cohort. And it gave us pause about giving men more than six or nine months of hormonal therapy and certainly not two years of hormonal therapy because the question is why did they really need it? And we also learned, uh, this was presented at the AUA a couple of years ago, that men often don't recover their testosterone if you give them hormonal therapy, and it's been shown that that's related to the patient's age. Older men don't recover as well. And it's also been shown to be related to the testosterone level uh, prior to starting the patient on hormonal therapy. And looking again at all-cause survival, you could see in terms of men whose testosterone was 300 or greater when they were at the last follow-up, there was almost a 23% difference in all-cause survival based on the T level. And factoring that in the uh, Cox regression, you could see it was more important in terms of significance than the uh, hormonal therapy. And looking at all-cause survival, really the high-risk patients, the older patients, and the men whose T did not recover were the significant factors that affects affected all-cause survival, and the hazard rate was about 1.5. So if you dichotomize the last T to 300 or less, um, the death rate was about 50% higher than men with low testosterone. So cause, this is thought-provoking, and it definitely needs more research, but it certainly explains um, the problem, perhaps, of keeping men on hormonal therapy too long when they're receiving radiation. We updated our survival data at DAU last year, and you can see it. This is 17 year survival now, both for the both low and intermediate risk patients. We're tracking 97 to 98 percent uh, cause specific survival, and that's also even in the high risk patients. NCCN3s, almost 78 percent at 17 years uh, had not died from prostate cancer. When we look at uh, uh, death from prostate cancer, the overall freedom from death was 94% at 17 years for all the patients. Even when the patients were NCN, NCCN3, they only lost about two years of mean survival after being treated with uh, the combination therapy. So the, the ones and the twos typically get monotherapy. They don't get external beam radiation. And this includes the Gleason gray group threes and fours. We don't treat, typically treat these men with either hormones or external beam anymore. But the NCC and threes, they typically get nine months of hormones, seed implant and external beam. It takes a long time to make sense of uh, what factors influence uh, the uh, cause specific survival. Certainly no high PSA, high Gleason score are important factors. But with this longer term data, we also started to see that dose made effect, uh, had an effect. Whereas previously we could see it had an effect on PSA failure, it took almost 15 years for us to start seeing that dose also affected cause specific survival. So if we dichotomize the PSA, the uh, dose, BED dose of 190 gray and above or less, you could see that there were almost twice as many deaths our odds ratio of 2.2 for men who received less than 190 gray. 190 gray, if you backtrack that to external beam radiation, is about 95 gray of external beam. This is a, a, a poster that is going to be shown, was supposed to be shown in Washington, but unfortunately because of the COVID, we sent our posters in electronically. So I've Put the poster together to show you some more updated data. This is a study in 545 men uh, who had 
seed implantation. Two years afterwards, they had a biopsy for all, no specific cause, just because I wanted to know. Remember, keeping in mind the surgeon's approach, I needed to be sure when I started this program that we were eradicating all of the tumors. So I subjected a set of patients, 545 men, two years after implantation to a 12-core systematic trust biopsy in the office. If the biopsy was positive or if the patients developed PSA failure and they had a negative biopsy at two years, they were re-biopsied. So there were 145 men who I re-biopsied up to six years after the implant. So these are the results of the biopsy. Gleason grade group one, Gleason grade group two to three, and Gleason grade groups four to five. On the left are B BED cut points. So this is a, these are dose cut points. 150 gray is the same as what the American Brachytherapy Society recommends, 100, 145 gray of iodine. And it's also the same dose as uh, 79 gray of external beam. So we got three dose, dose cut points. So you can see for each Gleason gray group, starting from one and going up to five, the higher the dose, the less likely the patient would have a positive biopsy. So if we get up to 200 gray, for group one, the positive biopsy, biopsy rate was 1.5%. For groups two to three, 0%. And for the high-grade disease, it was 5.3%. I also looked at a dose cut point of 220 for these higher-grade tumors, and there were no positive biopsies if the patients received the 220 gray. So this makes a lot of sense. The higher, the greater the disease the greater the dose of radiation needed to eradicate local disease, which should be the same object if you're doing a prostatectomy. You want to eradicate the local disease by taking out the gland. And if you do, you elect to do radiation therapy, you want to eradicate the disease, even though you're leaving the prostate in. When you look at the uh, Cox regression for survival, cause-specific survival, what factors influence it, you can see hormone therapy had no influence, but a last negative biopsy hugely influenced survival to the point where if men had a positive biopsy, they were five times more likely to die from prostate cancer versus a negative biopsy. Over here on the right, you see the PSA freedom of failure rate, 76% for negative biopsy, 17% for positive biopsy. And on the lower slide is the cause-specific survival, 94% for a negative biopsy, and 69% if a man had a positive biopsy uh, after brachytherapy. So there is a dire need. Make sure we give enough radiation. We're treating the patient with radiation therapy so we do not end up with a positive biopsy because the consequences of a positive biopsy mean substantially higher risk of prostate cancer mortality. Uh, one of our residents, two of our residents, Dr. Gall and Dr. Say, uh, put together this abstract, which they're going to present at the AUA, looking at what happens if you use the standard definition of biochemical failure. So we call that Phoenix failure. That's a Nader PSA plus two, standard dose, standard definition for radiation failure, versus an AUA definition, a PSA greater than 0.2 times two. Radiation oncologists often say, well, radiation works as well or better than pr prostatectomy because we have better results because uh, we have less biochemical failure. Well, that statement is accurate, but it's misleading because if you look at the curve over here, going up to 10 years, you see the PSA freedom from failure rate with our patients, the entire cohort, is 88.2%. But if you took the same patients and you applied the AUA definition of failure, 0.2, the freedom from failure is 81%. So if you're arguing with a colleague, okay, well, we're 7% better than you at 10 years, and the difference is even greater back here at five years, you would come to the conclusion that it's better than surgery. Well, that's false because you're using a definition. However, when you get out to 15 years, here we are at 77.9%. Using the Phoenix failure definition, and over here it's 77.5%. Though there's no difference at 15 years. 
So it is misleading. This is based on 2,600 patients. It is misleading, I believe, to try and compare apples to apples because there are different definitions until you get to 15 years. So that's just a caution. If you're looking at data and you're looking at people trying to compare things, if you're using a biochemical failure definition, you really need to wait 15 years for all things to be equal. Now let's talk about morbidity. This is the paper we published uh, back in 2012 on almost 2,000 patients. We spent a lot of time making sure we tracked all components we felt were going to influence the patients so we could learn more about what we should be doing or not doing. So this is, study was based on 12,000 AUA symptom score sheets that we collected in these patients over a period of 15 years. And here's the good news. When you look at the AUA symptom score, these are the mean numbers at baseline versus 10 years out. The baseline score on average was 7.4, and at 10 years out, it was 7.8. So there's no difference. So one might argue, okay, that's great. 10 years out, the patients are the same as they were before they were implanted. But there's something called regression to the mean. And if you're not aware of the specific differences for individual groups, you could be led to an incorrect conclusion. So we needed to break this information down. So what we did is we divided the patients up into symptom score groups, mild, seven or under, moderate, eight to 19, and severe symptoms greater than 20, 20 or greater at outset. So you could see the men who had the lowest symptoms, starting out here, zero represents the baseline, and these are changes. They were actually a little bit worse, 2.7. But the men who had really bad symptoms at the outset, look at them 10 years out. They're actually substantially better. We were told when we started the program back in 1990, you should not implant men who have severe urinary symptoms but you can, because you would make them worse. But what we learned is actually you make them better. And the reason you make them better is because many of these men had large prostates when we implanted them. And over time, prostate glands shrink by 50% from the radiation, and that's data we published. But let's look at it a different way. Let's take the men who had the mildest symptoms, so the score is zero to seven, because those, that's really the bulk of the men. And let's track them over 15 to 20 years and see what happens to them. So what I did here is I created a Kaplan-Meier survival curve, and the men who quote unquote died, they didn't die. So the men who went from a mild symptom score, that meant from a zero or to seven or higher to a moderate symptom, that would be an eight, or to a severe symptom, that would be above 20. So either you maintain your mild symptoms or you went beyond the mild symptoms. And what's the likelihood of being free from failure, failure defined as the worst symptoms? And you can see at 10 years, it's still pretty good, 73% of the men still maintain mild symptom, but by the time you get out to 15 years, it was only 40%. Now I know 15 years later, a lot of things are going on with these patients and it's not only, may not only be related to the radiation, that's something to, to put into consideration and there's no comparison to patients who not, did not get treated. That's one of the downfalls of the study, however, you can look at certain aspects. So let's take, for example, the men who got the supplemental external beam. They're down here at 26%, whereas if they didn't get sub, sub, uh, supplemental external beam, they're at 48%. So we can see there's a substantial difference between the men who got implant alone and got implant plus external beam. And when you do the Cox uh, analysis and look at the variables, Age wasn't a variable, smoking wasn't, but alcohol was, hypertension was, probably related to the medication, but so was external beam boost up here. And that gave us a hazard rate of 1.45, so almost a 50% chance, greater chance of moving from a low symptom score to a high, higher symptom score. So that's one of the reasons we got, we eliminated the external beam 
for my intermediate risk patients because of the negative long-term effect on urinary symptoms. That's also another reason, I'm gonna go back up here, to consider, do I really need to treat the entire gland? Even though I'm very good at getting rid of all the cancer, do I need to do it to the entire pro prostate? Do I need to take out the entire prostate? Do I need to do a radical prostatectomy in all these patients who are intermediate risk or maybe low volume high risk? Do I need to give them entire do I need to irradiate the entire gland? So I think the world is now changing for you younger urologists and we start thinking more about focal therapy. That's another different challenge. If I have a few minutes at the end, I'll tell you about my concept of that. I don't think we're there today with MRI. We need to do a lot more work, but it's certainly the future, I believe, of prostate cancer therapy is not to irradiate the whole gland and not to remove it. So let's go on. One of our residents, Jared, uh, graduated last year, he's now doing a fellowship at Hopkins, uh, published this study in uh, uh, the Journal of Brachytherapy, looking at what happens to men who present with just high symptom scores. So here's a distribution from 20 to 35 of those men who had very high AUA symptom scores. And looking at the long-term follow-up, this is the distribution of their current symptom scores at last analysis. And if we look down here at the table, you could see that only 14% of the men who presented with a AUA symptom score 20 or above got worse. So that meant 84%, uh, 85% actually had no change or they improved 64%. So again, you could implant a patient with bad symptom scores uh, and the majority of them are not gonna suffer long-term because their urinary symptoms get worse. So this is a show you some challenging cases and how you manage it. You, this is a sagittal image. This is a man with a very large TUR defect. You can see it here. And there's a catheter there. So what, if you wanted to implant this man, should you? A lot of people would say, no, he's got too much risk of incontinence. Well, I can tell you, if you took out his prostate, he probably has a high risk of incontinence too. So what are we going to do with this patient? Let's say he's a Gleason 8. And you don't want to do external beam because I already told you the dose is too low. So I want to implant this man, and I also want to give external beam, but I got to be very careful with this urethra. So what I do then is I'm, if I'm doing a seed implant, I just make sure I put the seeds well away from the cavity, and that patients like this will do very well because we've protected the urethra. We haven't reduced the dose, but we've moved the seeds far enough away so the dose doesn't get too high. Here's an example of a patient we're just about to finish. As he, we're in the operating room. The red represents the prostate. The green represents our target dose of 160 gray. And the yellow islands are 150%. And the little green dots are the seeds that have been placed. And you can see behind the white flashes are the actual seeds and how the reconstructed seeds line up with the actual seeds. So I'm getting done uh, this case. What's typically you see in the community is you've got, let's say 80 seeds and you put in 77 seeds already and you say, well, I got three seeds less. I'm just gonna put those three seeds in because I don't wanna have any waste. And what's the big deal if I got three seeds out of 80, that's not a lot of seeds. Uh, and so how could that possibly put the, hurt the patient? So I'm gonna put those three seeds in here. This is just a simulation. So now look what happens. I put the three seeds here in the center and this yellow went from being broken up and not covering the urethra here in the middle to totally covering the urethra. Now, this patient is probably going to be fine and uh, his PSA will go to zero. One thing I learned when I was a fellow from one of my colleagues was that the term radiation never forgets. So this tissue this central portion of the tissue has been highly irradiated. If this patient, patient leaves you and goes to see another urologist and 10 years later he develops obstructive symptoms, he's not gonna be obstructed because uh, of a large prostate, but he may be obstructed because the urethra loses its compliance because of the high dose of radiation. It causes an uh, avascular um, collagen deposition, which can lead to obstructive light symptoms. So it goes to see a urologist. 
doesn't know that much about radiation and the long-term effects of the radiation on the tissue, and he does a TUR in this patient, this patient will end up incontinent and with very difficult to manage strictures. So you don't want to find yourself in this situation by just putting seeds in randomly because you got a few left over. So let's talk about management of certain situations. Is there a size limitation? Can you do a man with a 50 grand gland, a 75 grand gland? How about 100 cc's? How about uh, uh, larger? So yes, you can. We published this paper back in 2007 uh, showing that you can reduce the prostate by almost a third if you give an LHRH agonist and a antiandrogen. Now you can use the, anti, the uh, LHRH antagonist and you get about a third of the volume of the prostate to shrink. You also can get a good implant. So here are the uh, D90 doses showing there was only one patient in this early study back in 2000 that had an inadequate implant plant of the 66 men who were implanted with glands above 50 cubic centimeters. The largest prostate I ever implanted was 200 cc's and that was after six months of hormonal therapy. Those are particular challenges and you need to have a special technique. You just can't use your regular technique and we don't have time to talk about it today but there is a way to manage pubic arch interference for those very large prostates and still get an excellent implant. What happens in men who um, receive hormonal therapy versus they don't receive hormonal therapy if they had a prostate that was larger than 50 cc's and you implanted them? Now, the reason we got involved with this study is because I was giving these men three months of hormonal therapy if they had a prostate larger than 50. And they were coming back to me three to six months after and saying, Dr. Stone, I don't mind their urinary symptoms, but man, I don't like the hot flashes. I don't like the fact that I'm not sexually active. Why? Why do I need to take the hormones? So a lot of times you learn from your patients. So I said, well, the ABS has said give hormonal therapy um, when you have a large prostate. And there was really no reason why, just that was dogma. So I said, Let's stop doing it. We stopped doing it. And what we found is, yeah, the ur patients had more urinary symptoms in the first three months. But over time, because the prostate gland shrunk, uh, there was no difference in the urinary symptoms between the men who got no hormones and the men who got hormones. So we stopped giving it to most of the men with prostates over 50, unless the prostate was really large. Or if the following occurred, this is something we also learned. If the man had a large prostate, uh, and had a symptom score greater than or equal to 15, the retention rate was much higher, 25%, versus if they didn't have a symptom score greater than 15. So that's another lesson we learned. If you can't get the symptom score down with alpha blockers and, uh, then you, and the prostate's larger than 50, you may want to consider three months of hormonal therapy. How do we manage retention? It's a paper we published in the European Urology looking at our incidents. Mitch Turk was one of our radiation residents. So we had about a 5% retention rate after seed implant, which is on the lower side looking at all these other studies, but something you need to recognize that can happen after a seed implant. How do you manage these patients? Well, we don't take them to the OR, that's for sure. We manage them with alpha blockers and I push the dose. So I will push the dose, one tamsulosin, two tamsulosins. If they're still having a lot of problem, I'll give them another alpha blocker at night. And if I need to add anti-inflammatory medications, I will. And I even consider putting them on a PDE5. Word of caution, these uh, alpha blockers are negative ionotropes. So you can put a patient into heart failure if you really push the doses. So you make, have to make sure you watch out for that. And I always tell the patients to check their ankles to see if they start accumulating fluid. I've even had to manage patients who do very well with these high doses and put them on diuretics until their symptom, their obstructive symptoms go away. So you don't necessarily, you don't wanna take them to the OR and relieve the obstruction with a TUR or some other form of ablative therapy because the consequences of doing that are onerous, which I will show you, and these patients eventually resolve their problems. It could take six months, but they eventually, almost all of them resolve their problems. 
What about a patient who has obstructive and irritated avoiding syndromes? I mean, that's really the difficult patient because they got to get up all the time at night. They can't pee and they've got severe irritation in, the, in their bladder. So they're miserable. So what do you do about them? So I maximize the alpha blockers and I add a little bit of anticholinergics at night. So uh, I add a little dihyphenhydramine, especially if they have nocturia. If that doesn't work, I put them on low dose anticholinergics. I've never seen a patient go in retention, but you have to keep an eye on them. You have to sonar them to make sure they're not developing retention. You're going to make sure they don't have narrow angle glaucoma. But this combination of alpha blockers and low dose anticholinergics works really well at night for those men until their symptoms resolve. What about prolonged retention? Should you put the patients on clean intermittent catheterization or should you take them off and do a TUR? So what's uh, the TUR rate after brachytherapy? Uh, well, it varies between zero and almost 9%. Our series, we had a 2.4% likelihood of a patient needing a TUR after having brachytherapy. So what happens to those patients who have a TUR? Long-term follow-up again. Stephen Mock was one of our uh, uh, residents. So was Michael Leithen. Michael off, went off to UC. UCSF did an oncology fellowship, and now he's a, an attending at Yale. So we had 2,500 patients. Uh, we excluded patients with a pre-implant TURP. 79 or 3.3 underwent channel TUR. The median follow-up was 7.2 years. The median time to the TUR was 14.8 uh, months, eight months, and 25% of the 79 develop urinary incontinence. And this is what the um, curve looks like. There's no TUR, the long-term incontinence rate was about 3%. One TUR, it's up here about 25%. Two TURs, it's up here about 75%. And you can see incontinence doesn't always happen right away. It actually gets worse over time. So, you never want to do two, two TURs on the patient, and you try and avoid one TUR because the risk of incontinence is not insubstantial. So bottom line for managing these patients with retention, CIC for at least a year. If you're going to do a TUR, you want to do a minimal channel TUR. You want to preserve the blood supply. So when we we're taught to do a TUR, we we're taught to control that blood supply posteriorly at the five and seven o'clock positions because of the bleeding, but you don't want to damage the blood supply because we're already dealing with a poorly vascularized tissue. So you preserve the blood supply, use minimum five cautery, and avoid widespread tissue destruction. What about bladder tumors? That's another risk that's talked about. Well, we looked, careful look at our patients, we found bladder tumors in 0.7%. Bottom line is there were only two patients that had invasive disease. So the risk of having invasive bladder cancer after an implant is less than 0.1%. Don't leave seeds in the bladder because you'll end up with a concretion. This is a stone that ended up encompassing a brachytherapy seed. So make sure there are no seeds in the bladder when you're done. Limit the size of a resection if you have to do a TUR. So here's an example of a small resection. We've only taken out a little bit of the obstructive tissue, only a little bit of the bladder neck in the middle. Here is an example of somebody who had a large TUR. You can see this brown fluffy stuff. Uh, this is non-heal tissue. It's never going to go away. Dr. Raka, in an early in his career, used to go back and resect this. All the patients ended up incontinent. Just leave it alone if you see it. How do you manage incontinence? So here's a patient that had a little bit of incontinence. It wasn't terrible. Here you can see the external sphincter is somewhat wide open. Um, there's a vera montanum. This is what his resection looked like because it occurred after a TUR, but it was, it was a minimal TUR, but he still became incontinent. Remember the 25%? But his sphincter was still compliant. So here I am putting collagen in, and it closed the sphincter up, and that patient did very well with a collagen injection. Here's another clinical situation where it didn't work. This patient um, had a Gleason 9 
T4 prostate cancer that invaded his Levitorini sphincter. So I ended up treating him with a protocol of uh, Taxotere and um, MSET, extra mustine phosphate, for three months. Then we stopped the chemotherapy, put his, did his implant and his external beam radiation. I put the C's actually into the Levitorini where the cancer was. The patient did great. He's 25 years out now and his PSA zero, but I killed his sphincter. Look at it. Here, a large patchless sphincter. I tried to put collagen in. And of course, every time you stuck the needle where you wanted it to go, the tissue was rock hard because of the radiation. And you got this bolus accumulation of collagen, which did absolutely no good. So if you run into one of these patients, unfortunately, they don't occur very often. This patient's incontinence would need to be treated with an external sphincter. Worst situation, and this will happen. If you see enough patients uh, who have had good implants uh, and they go to another, what I call cowboy urologist, and they keep doing multiple resections, you will end up with a disaster. And the patient will come back to you, and of course, they're gonna blame you. So this is what the patient had after two TURs of his prostate. He had this concretions inside his prostate, prostatic urethra. I couldn't even get a catheter past this. I would pop these stones out. Within two weeks, he'd be back with the same. So what am I gonna do with this patient? And a lot of people would take him and they'd do an exoneration, but no, you don't need to do that. So what I did is, I learned this when I was a resident because I took care of a lot of patients with posterior urethral strictures after uh, act pelvic fractures. I put a catheter, council kept catheter in, I ran the catheter through the bladder, into the urethra and out the urethra, and I tied a suture to it. And I had the patient pull on this string and pull the catheter through. That's the only way he could get it through and self-dilate himself. And he did this for a year. By a year, his urethra was rehabilitated and healed. His incontinence wasn't healed, but his urethra was healed. So he didn't have any more strictures any more problems, voiding, and then he went on and got an external sphincter and he was fine. So conservative treatment works very well in these patients. Thank God I had one patient in 30 years that had this situation. But they're manageable if you know how. Thank you very much. It's time to take some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Stone. That was, that was a great comprehensive review. Um, we do have some questions in the, from the listening audience. Two from Dr. Wensky at Columbia. First question is, what is your experience with periprosthetic hydrogel placement for um, low dose rate brachytherapy to decrease rectal toxicity? Excellent question. As, every, as the audience knows, we're using a, a space or other hydrogel. Um, so some new ones are coming out to have, protect the rectum for men who get external beam, IMRT or IGRT. And some, some uh, brachytherapists are using it for brachytherapy, but I personally don't think it's necessary. If a person has a good technique, uh, we should be able to keep those seeds away from the rectum. So the rectum doesn't get a lot of radiation. The problem with the spacer, I was an early consultant with, the, with a company, is you really don't know what blood supply you're disturbing when you move the rectum away from the prostate. So I prefer not to do it. And we're starting to see some disasters, not a lot, with space or I've seen some fistulas and I've seen some infections. So I would think it's not necessary unless you don't have the confidence to protect the rectum via the way you place the seeds. Okay, the second question is, what is your experience with high dose rate brachytherapy? Do you think there's any future for this modality? A high dose rate brachytherapy, so that's typically done with Iridium-192. Uh, those are temporary catheters, catheters, and the dose of radiation is extremely high. You still need to put in five to seven of them. The problem I have with HDR is that you, it's not real time. You place the wires under ultrasound. You put the patient in a room. You have to leave the room because of the radiation dose. And then the wires are pulled out of the prostate where you can't monitor what's going on. So you assume you know where the sphincter is. Prostate's always moving. And as you're pulling the wires out or the machine's pulling the wires out, 
it's also pulling the prostate. So the accuracy at the apex is not as good. And most, most centers don't have HDR machines. But having said that, centers that have it, they could do a good job. And it may even be an ideal treatment if one thinks about focal therapy. But you need a ex really experienced center to, to do HDR successfully.